We can live in an era where it is the government who fears us and wants to make sure they don't step on our toes. And in, in that case, we actually have a government that does protect our lives and rights and property. How does culture affect politics? We just saw last year a culture that allowed itself to be guided by its fear led to the largest infringements on our lives and our rights and our livelihoods and the largest transfer of wealth from those with the least to those with the most in human history, or at least in American history. Through culture or cultural narratives, yep. people were willing to surrender their freedoms. And through yep. cultural narratives, people may be willing to defend their freedoms. Mm -hmm. you know? All cultural changes come as a result of people believing that something is in their best interest or against their best interest. We can begin that cultural change that leads downstream to the political changes. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Across the United States, there's a grassroots movement about liberty. And here to talk to us about why this matters and what it means for the political future of the United States is Spike Cohen. You might remember him, he was the VP running mate to Joe Jorgensen of the Libertarian Party. He's now a libertarian activist. And Spike, real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Josh. I appreciate it. So I guess just starting off, can you tell us about this, you know, how does culture affect politics? Well, we just saw last year that a culture that allowed itself, largely, a culture that allowed itself to be guided by its fear led to the largest infringements on our lives and our rights and our livelihoods and the largest transfer of wealth from those with the least to those with the most in human history uh, or at least in american history and as a result of that we're now still suffering from that and we're still having arguments with people as to whether or not that was justified even though increasing amounts of data show that it was not it was didn't do anything to help slow the spread of the virus uh, and instead what it did was caused immeasurable harm to people's lives and, and livelihoods that's a direct result of people who were willing to accept that. There is nothing that government can do to us or for us that we are not willing to accept at large. And that's an important discussion because through culture or cultural narratives, yep. people were willing to surrender their freedoms. And through yep. cultural narratives, people may be willing to defend their freedoms. Mm -hmm. you know? how, how does this narrative go in terms of where you're engaging with people on this? Because I know Libertarian Party, you tend to have a stronger stance on more almost total liberty, depending on where you're at. Right. Uh, but telling people that things like this would be wrong, that handing over your rights and your ability to assemble and your ability to speak freely is wrong. Right. So I think the, the, the most crucial part of this is all cultural changes come as a result of people believing that something is in their best interest or against their best interest. And I think often libertarians and, and people that want to talk about liberty and freedom in general, we look at it from a philosophical or a moralistic standpoint. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't approach things that way. You know, they're just trying to live their lives on a day to day basis. It's actually government that has put them into that type of situation where they're up to here with all the, all the concerns they have and their bills and their mortgage and their student debt and everything else that they don't have time to have a moralistic or philosophical conversation. They want to know what's going to work. We can show that libertarianism is the most moral way. We can show that freedom and liberty are the best and most moral way to live, to interact with one another. What we need to show, and what I'm working and, and leading by example to show, is that we can show people how it also works the best and will benefit them the most. And when we do that, we can begin that cultural change that leads downstream to the political changes. That's an interesting discussion. Now, you know, the Democrats tend to be very good at that, telling kind of these, you know, stories yeah, right. yeah. and stuff like that. That they really work on the culture. Republicans, they tend to be more like economics and data and stuff like this. So where do libertarians fit in with it? Libertarians have largely been very cerebral. Uh, we have a lot of uh, engineers. We have a lot of business owners. I came from the business world. We have a lot of people that look at things systemically. You know, when most people look at things, they look at things and they have an emotional experience and they say that's terrible. And then they wait for someone to tell them, uh, or maybe not wait, but they have someone tell them, they, they, they look forward to someone telling them what to do. We tend to look at things as, wow, that was terrible, or wow, that was great. What led to that happening? We try to figure out what made that happen. So if it was good, we can have more of it. Or if it was bad, we never have that happen again, or at least have less of it. 
most people don't think that way. And so when we approach things and talk to people from a systemic standpoint, it often doesn't connect with them. If I tell you that taxation is extortion and you say, well, but how are we going to have roads and schools and police departments and fire departments? And I don't address that and just keep saying that taxation is an immoral way to collect revenue. We're not having a good conversation and you're going to walk away thinking I'm a crackpot. But if I can explain to you how having a more voluntary system of funding leads to better and, and more easily accessible and, and more valuable versions of those services than the model that we have now, now we're able to actually have a discussion and now I can show you how Liberty not only is the best way, but it actually works better too. On the note of taxation, since we kind of got into this topic, sure. I mean, I, I do know a lot of libertarians say, you know, taxation is theft, and, you know, I mean, really, you go back to the founding of this country. Uh -huh. The I IRS is a newer organization. Yes, yep, yep. Uh, it was not constitutional. They had to change the constitution to put yep. it into place, yep. and it used to be that, you know, tariffs and things like this mainly financed the government, but, you know, I, I think... I mean, on the, on the state level, it was, of course, a little different, but on the federal level, it was right, like that. Right. And, and a lot of people now become so used to certain government services that they, they really can't see other options for it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how do you deal with that, where right. people have been accustomed to government playing such a large role? How would you ever transition out of that, and what do, what, do you what do you recommend as the kind of solution to this? Well, so this is a perfect example of what we were just talking about. So if you look, everyone is angry about the government providing or misproviding something like any of the we've seen uh, you know protests and riots over pre police brutality we've seen protests over uh, mask mandates and lockdowns we've seen protests and, and and riots over the outcome of the election we've seen all sorts of different things each of these things is people saying I don't like what government is providing me having robbed me first for it now there's a reason for this if I open up a business of any kind and my model was to go around here and point a gun at everyone's head and say, you have to give me however much money I think you owe me, but then you can come back later and I'll give you whatever my service is. Not only is that inherently wrong for me to do that, but there is absolutely no reason for me to provide good value in that, right? Because I don't have to actually demonstrate value and have you voluntarily give me money. I can just threaten you and get the money. So violent monopolies are not a good way to get services. So the, the conversation that we have with folks is about how all of the things that we want, all the things that libertarians want and everyone else wants. We want to have roads and infrastructure. We want to have a civil society. We want to have things like parks and libraries. We want to have things like protection against criminals and things like that. We just think that the model of extortion has proven itself to be a uniquely terrible way to do it. And there are ways to voluntarily fund these types of things. And that's an interesting discussion that it is, in a way, involuntary. You don't, you don't have a choice with yeah. it. You have to hand them your money. And a lot of people, I think, are unhappy when they see the details of how their money is being spent. Yes. And there's not a lot of accountability with yeah. it, especially when you get into the areas of unions and, you know, earmarks oh, and yeah. handouts, basically, through Bail these things. Bailouts to and billionaires. Bailouts to why would there be accountability? Again, if I can just rob you at gunpoint, why do I have to show you that I'm accountable at all, right? You're not giving me money because you perceive that the money you're giving me isn't worth as much as the value I'm giving you, like in any other voluntary arrangement would be. You're giving it to me because the alternative is for me to make your life miserable, to put you in jail, to, uh, you know, to, to, to garnish your wages, to fine you even further, to take your property. It's extortion. It's not a good model and it doesn't work. So for example, if we had voluntarily financed fees that you could pay on goods and services, basically government warranty fees that you could pay, where if you didn't want to pay it, you didn't have to pay it, but you also wouldn't get the government's protection. If something went wrong with the transaction, you wouldn't be able to sue. If uh, you know something malicious happened, you wouldn't be able to call the police about it. By having it where you now decide whether what government is charging you is worth less than, or it costs less than the value they're giving you and therefore you're willing to do it, now that inherently forces government to be more accountable for the money that they're, that they're spending, to be more efficient with it, to provide it in, in, in safer and fairer and more equitable ways, ways that you actually want. Everything changes when government is forced to do what you and I and literally everyone else except for government has to do, which is provide value in exchange for the money we receive. Well, folks, two months on now, and we are still totally demonetized by YouTube. But given the situation where we have to censor ourselves if we want to really stay on this platform and make it work, we've decided on something else, which is this. We've launched a new platform called Epic TV, e -P -O -C -H -T -V .com. and through this we're able to publish uncensored content. 
news that can criticize anything we'd like, news that can talk about anything we'd like, news that can give you real information from any part of the world about any topic without having to worry whether individuals will censor it. And in this current environment where information is being controlled, where narratives are being controlled, and where anyone who steps outside the boundaries of what is the accepted narrative by the fact checkers, you know, quote unquote, by different big tech organizations, by media organizations, and so on. This is something that we believe is needed for the modern political environment, where people should be able to call things out. People should be able to question things. This is the basis of the fourth estate in America. The belief, again, that media should be able to hold government power in check, and that media should be able to inform the public about the issues they should be informed about, because that is the basis of our election system. An informed public making informed decisions. If you control this system of information, you control the political system. And folks, being a media organization, we can't stand for that. And so again, we have created an uncensored platform, Epic TV. And anyone who wants to support Crossroads or support our broader mission of bringing real news, uncensored news, it's not afraid to stand up for what matters, please check out our website, epochtv.com, E-P-O-C-H-T-V.com. Check out the link below. And folks, please support us there.